Okay, I think we can start now. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good day to you all from wherever you're joining us from. Um, my name is Isabel Njihia from UNDRR, and I will be moderating this session. So just a few announcements to begin with. Um, for those of us who want to follow the webinar in French, please select the language at the bottom of your screen. And I'd also like to remind uh, all of us that the participants are on mute by default. Should you wish to share a question with us that you need addressed, please uh, type it in the Q&A box at the bottom. Should you wish to share just a comment, uh, please share that on the chat. So a quick reminder to our speakers, please remember to speak slow enough for our interpreter Jonathan so that he's able to follow with us in, in, a, in a good way. So to begin, I would just like to welcome all of you once again to this uh, webinar on community-based disaster risk reduction approaches in the context of COVID-19 with a focus of Africa, the African region. Uh, we know that the SDG number 10 focuses on trying to reduce the inequalities in the community and especially target 10.1 talks specifically about trying to bridge the income gap because we have seen that the, number, the majority of the inequality effects are from income generating activities and that affect the livelihoods. We have also seen that the disaster risks and the damage to, caused by disasters are, are felt disproportionately in different uh, proportions of the population with the most at risk communities getting or bearing the most brunt. So with this backdrop, we have organized this webinar especially with our partners between GNDR and um, UNDRR with the aim of um, examining coherence between community actions and the policies with an aim to try and bring together a proper understanding on how we can strengthen the efforts in implementing the Sendai framework as a tool towards building community resilience and promoting best practices at the community level. So to kick us off, I would like to welcome Mr. Amjad Abashar from UNDRR to give us some opening remarks. Mr. Abashar brings a vast experience of working in the humanitarian field, as well as the development world. And uh, he has previously been uh, the head of office for the um, Arab States region for the Africa I mean, the, the North African region of uh, our office. And so he has a proper understanding of the whole region as a whole. Mr. Abashar, please welcome for your remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Do you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes, we do. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Let me just uh, uh, begin by um, giving a special welcome to um, uh, Mr. Vijay Komar, the executive director of the GNDR Global Network for uh, Civil Society Organizations for Disaster Risk Reduction. And I'm also honored to be uh, uh, participating with uh, Bo Gaston, who's the general coordinator of Geotechnology, Environmental Assessment, and Disaster Risk Reduction in Cameroon. Uh, Madam Edna Kaptoyo the, from Pastoral Communities Empowerment Program. Um, and I believe you're based in Kenya. And uh, Emmanuel Sek, also I welcome him from End the Energy. It's a pleasure to be among uh, such distinguished uh, colleagues. I just wanted to begin by just uh, saying a few words. Um, and first of all, uh, welcoming uh, my cooperation or the cooperation of our organization with GNDR, who uh, we, we are working together to uh, arrange for this webinar. And, um, and I'm really welcome their efforts in promoting uh, the resilience of communities, which is an area that is of great importance for us in United, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. And to be honest with you, if I be frank, it is also a weakness in our uh, ability to uh, deliver on disaster risk reduction. So this is, makes it such an important um, uh, area of work. And the reason is, you know, when disaster strikes, we know that they affect the members of our uh, of our society disproportionately. And uh, mostly the most vulnerable are the ones who are most affected, the poor, the marginalized, and often members who are at the community level at the, and local level who suffer the most. 
Now, we know that disasters are not only increasing in magnitude, but they're also increasing in frequency, uh, possibly to the, uh, uh, as a result of also climate change. But now today, we're talking about even a more complex environment, uh, particularly in light of COVID-19, which is giving us uh, uh, a new reality uh, for emerging disasters, and, and, and particularly in the way that they're the different way that they're affecting humanity and impacting our social and economic systems in unprecedented ways as we speak today. Now, uh, the COVID-19, it's not only challenged the global health system, but it's also testing our capacities to prepare and respond to such an emergency. And having said that, disasters have not gone away. Uh, they've just been, uh, you know, added uh, element of COVID-19. Now, the Sendai framework um, calls for a comprehensive approach uh, to, uh, uh, to disaster risk reduction. And it underlines the importance of having an all of society engagement. Uh, and it mentions specifically the local level uh, implementation, the local level role, and it highlights the significance of, of the role of local governments stakeholders and communities in building resilience. And uh, UNDRR is a strong advocate for the empowerment of local governments, as we know they are the closest, uh, they are closest to the communities and we also know that communities are often always actually the first responders before to a disaster before uh, international aid comes in, you know, 24 or 40 hour, 48 hours later. So uh, we have been working, one of the areas that we've been working to reach with the local government is what we call is the Making Cities Resilient Campaign, which is ending in 2020. And uh, we are hopeful now, and we'll discuss this at another time, is uh, we should be soon launching uh, the Making Cities Resilience Campaign for 2030. And uh, it will be uh, building on the, uh, the older campaign and but with a much focus on the role of on partners and, and leveraging partners such as uh, my colleagues um, the, the organizations that my colleagues present to uh, have more effect and impact at the local level now we know also that civil societies play and uh, um, uh, civil civil organizations society organizations have a big role to play because the very nature of their work is at the community level and uh, and there's a lot of uh, this, uh, disasters when they happen at the local level, and um, and they, they it's important that uh, uh, a, a lot of capacity building happens at that level. For example, in DRR training, uh, development of strategies, advocacy work, and uh, in order to bring the desired change to uh, uh, the community level and ensure that there is more resilience. I. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, one of the uh, important things that I want to also praise is the role of civil society, volunteers, uh, and organized voluntary work uh, as being critical to embedding a culture. We need a culture of prevention uh, for disaster risk reduction. It has to be um, in, embedded in, in, in communities and, and people's minds. Um, so um, I, I believe that uh, before I stop, I wanted to just say two things that I think um, are important that we could work on together uh, at this particular time. And these are just initial inputs that I believe would be important to consider as we go forward in strengthening the relationship between uh, UNDRR, UN system, UN and UN partners with civil society organizations, local governments and communities. One of them is really about risk knowledge. I think we need to work a little bit harder to ensure that we are stronger uh, in providing the evidence that is needed of where disasters occurs, the statistics behind that, and make sure that that is used to inform development plans. The other area that I think is important is really about risk governments. Uh, there are many other important areas, but I'm, I'm just thinking that these are, are, are sort of the springboards for stronger disaster risk reduction in the future. The second area I wanted to mention was risk governance, governance and, and by that I mean ensuring that uh, local uh, communities, uh, civil society organizations at the local level 
take part in decision-making mechanisms, coordination mechanisms, such as national platforms, local national platforms or national coordination mechanisms for disaster risk management. And more importantly, to uh, uh, ensure that uh, uh, they contribute uh, to the development of local disaster risk reduction strategies, uh, which uh, as some of you may know, the, the year 2020, all countries are supposed to have in place national uh, disaster risk reduction strategies as well as local disaster risk reduction strategies. And I believe that the work on local disaster risk reduction strategies would require uh, uh, specific uh, engagement, strong engagement from uh, the local governments and local communities and civil society organizations. So I'm hoping that uh, this uh, webinar offers us a great opportunity to really for us to understand the experience of the community practitioners and uh, the, the experts such as yourself and the community practitioners and hopefully we'll be ending by making recommendations for future program particularly considering uh, uh, the, the context that we have of COVID-19. And I just wanted to uh, reiterate the commitment of my organization to continue working with civil society organizations, stakeholders, and local governments in the African continent. So with that, I look forward to learning uh, much from the experts that we have and the good colleagues that we have alongside us. And uh, I hand over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amjad. Thank you for those remarks, those kind remarks, and also for emphasizing on the need to have uh, data and for coherence in our approach in collecting this kind of information. Um, I, will, I would like now to introduce um, or to give this chance to Mr. B.J. Kumar, the Executive Director of GNDR. Mr. Kumar has a long track record in humanitarian and development work as well, particularly in disaster risk reduction. He also has a lot of expertise in leading and managing civil society organizations and networks, um, gaining this being gained through hands-on experience in Africa, Europe, South, South Asia, and Southeast Asia as well. He's a strong advocate of shifting power from international systems to community-led capacities, um, and also known very well as a people power advocate. Mr. Kumar? Please take this moment to share your remarks as well. Thanks, Isa. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm humbled by your introduction. Uh, uh, thanks, um, Mr. Amjad. It is a really, it's really a privilege for us to be working with UNDRR. Uh, we have been immensely impressed uh, by UNDRR's efforts, which is tirelessly uh, trying to pursue uh, the agenda of uh, community-based resilience or resilience of the communities and challenging the systems and trying to see how we can adopt a all society approach uh, to reduce the risk, build the resilience of the communities who are most at risk. It's a commendable job and we are proud to be your partner. I, I, I'm also seeing it as a privilege to share the, uh, being part of the uh, distinguished panelists who are here and uh, like Edna, uh, Emmanuel, and uh, Mr. Gaston. Uh, and it's also, it's always a privilege to be uh, speaking uh, before the boss. My boss is Emmanuel, who is part of our uh, board, uh, global board, who has been elected to be part of our global board uh, in GNDR. Uh, it's, a, it's a really privilege to be talking about uh, the issue that we, uh, that we are currently talking of. Uh, I, would, uh, I would perhaps like to uh, start, if you, saw, you allow me, then I'd like, like to start my presentation. Uh, uh, yes, please. So that I can By combine and reduce the time. Yeah. That would uh, be great. Yes. Please remember our interpreter. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, hope I am okay in terms of Jonathan. Hope I am okay uh, in terms of reaching you in terms of my language. And yes, I, can, yes. I can see that uh, more than 200 friends, colleagues, and supporters and collaborator uh, are already in this uh, discussion. It's just amazing. And uh, this is a brilliant way that we can reach uh, the society as a whole. And the, not only the community of practitioners, community of practitioners, but also the society as a whole to challenge the current model of uh, 
perpetuating the risk, perpetuating the disaster. Let me come, come back to this uh, soon. Uh, Ades, so can you please take to the, can you please go to the next slide, please? Now, if you see it, I'll just actually talk of three critical statistics that we see these days. The COVID-19 is, 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 has actually taken us completely off balance. Uh, this is a global pandemic, uh, which is manifesting itself, like what World Bank is predicting, that we'll be going back to 1930s Great Recession yeah, in terms of our economy. A uh, World Food Program is saying 130 million is almost doubling the number of people who will be uh, hungry and uh, who will be living with hunger. Uh, and yeah, as, you, as all of us we know, now at least 70% of the schools were closed in one figure that I actually uh, heard from UNDRR webinar uh, recently. It is almost 90% of the students were out of the schools. This is, is a classic scenario that we are confronted, confronting today. Now, if I, if I put it together, can you please go to the next one, Adeso? If I put it together, what we are experiencing, that this is, this is a global pandemic, a global crisis, which could have been prevented, which could have been prevented. It was not necessary to have the current impact that we are currently having. Now, what does it mean that this pandemic is impacting all walks of our life? And this could have been prevented by simply adopting a risk informed development as a mechanism in everything and anything and everything that we do. Secondly, this pandemic is global, but experience is very, very local. And this experience, as Isa, you are talking of, this experience of pandemic, as we experience in any disaster, is the disproportionate impact on the people who are most at risk are the people who are most vulnerable. And the countries who are experiencing it, then you can see within those countries, the most vulnerable are the most hit, including in the developed countries. Next, please. Now, in this context, next, please. Now, in this context, localization, in my understanding, is what is the way forward. And what we mean by localization, can you just go back, Adesu? Go back, please. Yes. So, localization, what it means, in my understanding, and understanding of GNDR, is shifting power and access to resources. Localization enables local communities most at risk to participate, influence, and take decisions on the risk-informed development policies and practices. That's fundamental. This is where we are talking of shifting the power. Next, please. Now here, what we are actually talking of, can we build the capacity? You are going faster, uh, Adesso. Uh, can we build the capacity of the communities most at risk? Can we ensure that a good governance, as Amjad was talking of, can we actually ensure that the risk governance is established and is accountable? Can we ensure that enabling policies are in place? We come up with the national strategies and policies that we committed in each country. By 2020, we'll have the national strategy for disaster risk reduction. Uh, can we ensure that we have appropriate linkages of these local structures with the, the global, uh, uh, global uh, policies and practices as well. Now, just to give you an example, let's say if, uh, just, to, just to give you an example, Adeso, you are not, can you please go with me in terms of the slides? I think that you, the slides are running ahead of me. Yeah? Uh, just before, yeah. If I give an example, for example, we saw that in, in uh, Somalia, uh, we saw that actually the way they, uh, it, they actually identified, uh, they identified the various uh, priorities in the local context. This is an example that actually for us, you can see this. Let me not get into the details of example. If you want, you can see this in our website. We have the report and the views from the front line. And uh, you can actually go to the link in the views from the front line 
where you can see the the views that is coming from the uh, local people local authorities and local civil societies in terms of their analysis of risk and the way they prioritize and the way they are coming up with action plans in 50 countries across the globe so that is one thing that i will actually encourage you to uh, access our uh, uh, our website and also go to the vfl site so you can touch the views from the frontline site where you can see this now local uh, the the localization is also critical for a risk informed development so risk informed development is all about prioritizing risk faced by communities living most at most vulnerable condition and the risk informed approach is always from the perspective of the people most at risk now this has the other dimension that actually talks of whenever we are talking of risk informed development it is also the local level participation which is needed and which is essential to see how you design the response itself how you design the practice the policies and practices related to risk informed development uh, so when the risk is not informed or where the risk informed development is not taken up then the experience is that the development program actually increase the risk rather than reducing or bringing in a transformative change in the lives of people that is what we are actually experiencing countries after countries so like say the uh, the disasters and development are closely linked now for example in charge we say we saw that that actually uh, when the communities were analyzing uh, the the risk they identified corruption as one of their biggest risk and uh, the flood that they are experiencing they attributed that to the corruption which is making it as a disaster inequality is seen as one of the driver which is actually making the disaster happen so now this is what uh, this is what we actually hear now in this context so what we are actually saying community based disaster risk management is the only way forward and there we are actually talking of like take the example of covid 19 context said so even if it is a pandemic which is of global nature that i said but the experience is local unless we know how we address how we get the water to the slums how we how we ensure that the, the people who are on the move migrant populations who are actually dependent on uh, the the daily ways how their livelihood is protected protected how can we ensure that the the people come and adopt a social distancing those distance and go to the school how can we ensure that the people are accessing the health services who do not have a a, a primary health center near them because they are outside the outside the city because that is a slum or they are living in a, uh, a rural area which is away from the men's mainstream health, health systems now the we are also saying that there is a need for ensuring for designing this it has to be ensuring that the community is most at risk is participating in designing those uh, projects participating in designing those solutions and that is best done when the civil society organizations get an option to facilitate that process and that is best done when civil society organizations work with other actors and unless we come as all society uh, we cannot actually achieve it before i end i will actually submit the four specific areas uh, that i would actually submit for your consideration the first is if whenever we are talking of this uh Adeso, can we actually take to the last uh, slide please last but one slide yes the put the put the resilience of communities most at risk as the top political agenda it is a it is all about power relationships it is all about the state and the local authorities uh, taking a decision to prioritize uh, the resilience of the uh, communities most at risk and it is also essential to recognize that unless we come together unless we collaborate unless we coordinate this is not going to be achieved so that is where we are saying we can have multiple policies multiple global frameworks but unless we integrate all the global frameworks 
UNFCC, the climate change, the Sendai framework, the sustainable development goals, unless it is actually integrated with the community-based actions is not going to be useful. And at the national level, unless it is coordinated and be coherent, that is not going to be effective. And at the global level, unless we know how to communicate among the various global frameworks and the global initiatives, then we will not be achieving it. And recognizing it is always the community at risk and the local authorities which are in the front, in the, in the front line. Unless they have the capacity, unless the resources are shifted there, unless they, they have the I think we lost Mr. Kumar. Mr. Kumar, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, I think um, we had a technical issue there. Adesu, could you please check with Mr. Kumar and maybe we can have him give uh, some remarks at the end of uh, the webinar so we don't lose a lot of time. Is that okay? Yes, it is. Okay, I'll follow that. Okay, thank you. Thank you and thank you to Mr. Kumar on that presentation on localization of, um, I mean, the process of localization and that of um, community-based approach as an important process in achieving sustainable development and uh, resilient communities. So at this point, we will have another presenter, Mr. Bo Gaston, who is the general coordinator of geotechnology and environment, no, of geotechnology, environmental assessment and disaster risk reduction from Limbe, uh, Cameroon, based in Cameroon. And he will be talking to us on the importance of locally led risk assessments to effectively address COVID-19 response and recovery elements uh, and what to include in that process. So Mr. Bo comes to us um, from uh, a, a, a space, what do you call it? Space sciences background. He has a background in geology, yes, and applied the space sciences. He has done quite a bit in DRR in, the, in Cameroon, uh, as, as well as in other areas. He has worked closely on environmental changes and environmental issues, applying uh, space sciences in this. He has also worked with um, quite a number of uh, national, international and international NGOs applying geospatial sciences in environmental protection. So I think Mr. Bu, me and you will have a lesson on <laughs> applied sciences so I can have a better understanding on this. So please uh, take it away in the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you Isabella for that introduction. Uh, Adesso, should I share my screen or you want to share from your end? Maybe I just share from my end. If, if you can share, please, yeah, because I'm having some problem with my Yeah, so thanks, share, Isabella, please. for the introduction. I will just go straight for the purpose of time to do my presentation. Uh, my presentation, most of my examples are actually drawn from the views from the front line, as already mentioned by the Global Network for civil society organization and disaster risk direct, uh, executive director about views from the front line just to give a, a simple background for those who may not have a good knowledge about views from the front line that this is one of the flagship process by GNDR we started since in 2009 with the global objective to contribute towards the monitoring of the Yugo framework and now we're continuing with this process to help in contributing towards the monitoring of the Sendai framework. And the experience we've had so far from the views from the frontline implementation indicates that you need to take into consideration local context in whatever we're trying to do in designing projects and designing uh, measures in risk reduction because it is only through this local context that we are able to understand exactly what is happening 
and to design necessary responses rather than trying to use a one size fit all approach. So it is also through understanding of this local context that we feel is going to help us, especially at this time of COVID-19 in designing any necessary responses as well as recovery programs in different communities. When it comes to views from the front line, we always use local consultation through uh, general reflection and knowledge creation with local actors. So we also feel that we need to think about this approach as a vital way of coming up with long and short term mitigations effects of COVID-19. So far, the current views from the front line that we are actually implementing as the GNDR executive director already mentioned has been going on in a number of um, countries around the world and in Africa in particular, 17 countries have been participating with a number of uh, evidence base that have we've gathered and which is helping us to engage with local communities in designing specific actions in building community resilience. The objective has been to strengthen inclusion and collaboration between at the risk people, civil society organization and government in the design and implementation of policies and practices that reduce risk and strengthen resilience. So far from the result of heart during these views from the front line and the conclusions that we've drawn from it indicate that, especially in Africa, so what I'm presenting is the aggregation of the result from all the African countries that are participating in this uh, view from the front line shows that we are having increase in flood, drought, as well as insecurity. And it will require that over and most of the communities do indicate that over the last five years, so the five years after which we put in place the Sunday framework, disaster risk has either been stable or has been slightly increasing in most of these communities. So actions that has to do with trying to reduce the, the, the threat and risk from flood and unemployment as well as insecurity, particularly for future generation will be necessary. In most communities, stakeholders also do feel that there are still a lack of insufficient structures, policies, mechanisms, as well as resources in place to promote an enabling environment for inclusion. And when we think about coherence, which has already been mentioned also by the executive director for GNDR, with the case drawing example in Cameroon, we realize that climate change, for example, as well as disaster risk reduction, has a linkage. But when we look at in most countries, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptations are managed by different ministries. And sometimes we find it difficult. These ministries do not have effective coordination as well as collaboration to foster coherence. So through the work of views from the front line, we are trying to encourage the building of coherence at the front line. Some simple example from views from the front line that we've gathered over the years, which I would like to just mention a few years, is that VFS has helped us raise disaster risk and resilient building awareness among community members by identifying threats, factors that drive everyday disasters by making it clear on how collective actions and community are important in building community resilience. We've also used views from the front line to be able to build trust in at-risk communities by providing an important opportunity to raise awareness that apart from government, which sometimes is the official mandatory organ in, in carrying out disaster risk reduction in every country, that civil society organizations are also an important partner in disaster risk reduction as well as building resilience. Why it is not only uh, carrying out or doing monitoring, civil society organizations are also very good in advocacy, in campaign, in knowledge sharing, in analyzing and in data collection, as well as 
creating that gap between communities and local government, which sometimes is always lacking. And specifically with regards to COVID-19 and DFL, we realized that during our last data collection or surveys in different communities, we, we never thought of or surveyed COVID or coronavirus as a threat in any of these communities. But we now know that coronavirus is a threat in almost all the com communities in which we are currently implementing views from the front line. As we find in many of the statistics still around us, where there are still a number of rising cases of coronavirus in many countries around the world, and which requires that whatever activities we're carrying out in communities, we actually need to take this into consideration in trying to make sure that we, we, we contribute towards stopping the spread of this virus. So we look at views from the front line from the point of view that it can actually be a vehicle through which to step up sensitization on COVID-19 in countries, providing support to at-risk population, ensure population observe measures by WHO in coping the spread of the virus. We will be able to better understand the exact situation of COVID-19 in most countries through local consultation and mobilization. This will include understanding the culturally, socially, and economic appropriate approaches to controlling this infection. This approach will also lead to understanding the longer term socioeconomic impact of the pandemic and the governance issues, which, if in, which might include quite often the loss of livelihood, failure of businesses. There are already quite a number of increasing unemployment in many countries. So all of these different impacts will need to use the right approach to be able to understand and be able to come up with the right response as well as recovery. So DFL will be actually a good tool to be able to understand the different local priorities, the actions, the barriers in these different communities. What we've realized so far with our work in views from the front line and particularly at this particular juncture is that COVID-19 has actually pushed us into a liminal space, which requires that we need to take serious decisions at this particular point in time if we just want to adjust in terms of coping with the virus or do we really want to adapt certain aspects of our work that we're doing or are we thinking about taking a total transformation of what we've been doing in order to effectively take a new approach in, in, in ensuring that we do not have such future impact because we now fully understand that disaster risk, there's nothing we can call natural disaster in every disaster, including even the current coronavirus pandemic we are all facing. They are not natural. They are all coming as a result of human hand of human activities, anthropogenic activities. How do we ensure how, what kind of reflection we need to carry out to ensure that we curb or stop this from happening in the near future? I think we did this as a few I put together to share with you, uh, unless if there might be some questions and then I'll be able to clarify. Thank you very much, Isabella. Thank you so much, Mr. Bo. Just a kind reminder for questions, please post them in the Q&A and we'll try as much as we can to answer the most of them at the, towards the end of the webinar. In case we are not able to, we'll definitely provide on offline um, responses. Uh, but then for comments, you can still use uh, the chat. Thank you so much again, Mr. Bo, for that presentation and for the reminder that we have to look back to learn the lessons, even as we plan forward in an effective way. Our next presenter before the gender activists come on my neck is Ms. Edna Kaptoyo, who will be talking to us um, from representing the Pastoral Communities Empowerment Program uh, as part of the TASFAG, TAS, TAS TAG Consortium. Uh, she'll be speaking to us about the best practices and opportunities for integration of uh, climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction for community re resilience. 
Um, Edna is a social development specialist. Uh, she has worked with um, indigenous people's rights and climate and gender justice, uh, advocating for those uh, rights. She has actively engaged in a lot of international um, initiatives, including with the UN and the financial institutions, processes relating to environment, human rights, and sustainable development. And she has focused her work on advancing issues and concerns of indigenous people in the Africa context, both um, at all levels, including the local, national, regional, and international levels. So Edna, please take the next 10 minutes to share your thoughts with us. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, Isabel. And uh, thank you all. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, I'd like to share a few uh, best practices, but uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to really uh, highlight the importance of uh, integration of community-based adaptation and also community-based DRR at the different levels. Uh, within the international process, uh, we can see that the climate change adaptation and DRR are conceived, I mean, uh, within two different UN uh, bodies and frameworks. However, even though they are conceived in the different areas, they both have the overarching goal to reduce vulnerability, increase adaptive capacity of community, moderate the damage that can be posed by climate related risks and hazards and other disasters, and also the important aspect of enhancing community resilience to these risks. So they both are complementary strategies that um, could have mutual beneficial uh, implications if they are integrated and also if they are best aligned at the different levels from national to local level. And they are complementary in the fact that they address the same issues and also they can continue to support uh, the resilience of community, hence uh, leaving no one behind in terms of addressing issues of inequality that may arise even with, I mean, continuation of this risk at the different levels. Next slide. So I'm going to share a few best practices where we've seen uh, integration of uh, climate change adaptation and DRR and which also are supporting community resilience. They are not exhaustive. We know uh, civil society, non-governmental organization are really partnering with uh, government agencies at the devolved governance system at the national level and also with communities and working with communities to come up with a uh, different uh, strategies to address the risks that integrate, integrate both DRR and, and climate change adaptation. And uh, they're doing amazing work in the different parts of Africa, but I'm going to highlight a few cases that I see as best practices that could be scaled up. We know uh, with climate change adaptation and also disaster risk reduction, climate information for early warning systems is really important for community planning and also uh, for decision making in terms of addressing issues that and risks that impact uh, community resilience and also their livelihood systems. And uh, one of the examples is where we've had cases uh, organization are using a, a platform called the participatory scenario planning where it brings a different actors on board from the agricultural agencies from the uh, meteorological department from health and other sectors and they work together with communities really to who have holders of traditional knowledge ensuring inclusion of gender so you have elders women youth also engaging and also people with different um, livelihood system, the farmers, the pastoralists, and also those who are practicing agro-pastoralists, like in the case of Garissa, and also we've had those piloted in other local communities in the different developed units in Kenya. And they design um, 
uh, a chart where they're able to plan using the knowledge of both uh, meteorologists and those from the traditional weather forecasters and they're able to come up with a plan on how each season they can plan on use of their range for grazing or when to farm and what can work in a particular season and it's been proven to be useful as well in terms of supporting work of different agencies and also supporting the livelihood system of communities in adapting to cases of drought and also in terms of ensuring sustainable use of resources and also mitigating risk like those of flooding. As well, um, we work in different sectors and, 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 and I think communities uh, like in case of Borana in Kenya, in Isiolo, usually face drought cases. And, and when we have the devolved system of governance, a lot of policies are being developed even at the local level and communities have their own system as well for rangeland use during dry seasons and also other season when there is plenty of rain, for instance, and there was an opportunity where non-state actor was able to work with the community and also in partnership with the county government and during the design of land use policy to be able also to integrate the traditional rangeland management system, which was shown to be able to be responsive to droughts and also other risks. So community were able to to, to, to develop a map where they're looking at, at the different risk areas and also develop a system where it can be reflected in the county planning and also ensure that it's sustainable. Uh, uh, different cases as well, also where community were able to do participatory mapping, which was also able to inform the national adaptation plan using the traditional knowledge held by people where they could map risk from decades ago and communities in Chad amongst the Mbororo people who are fulfilled the speakers and they range across Cameroon, Chad, they're also part of Nigeria. They were able to design uh, a 3D map where they worked with national actors and this also influenced national actors to appreciate the role that community have in terms of knowledge of risks and how also it can help them in terms of coping with climate change and also the issues of conflict and they were able to inform the national adaptation plan of chad for indigenous communities uh Edna, there's slow an down initiative. a little bit oh slow down apologies bit. okay in my mother tongue we speak so loud faster so apologies and also there is a aspect where communities of indigenous origin from Kenya, also other part Tanzania. Uh, we have those from uh, Cameroon and also from those uh, in Asia. They've been able to design uh, and pilot a community-based monitoring information system. So this is an initiative where community monitor all aspects of their wealth and health being. Uh, they look at their territories, they map out even the issues about climate change impacts, the risks, and also they use it to track even the uh, international agreements and also national agreements, what governments have signed up on, what they want to do, and also using their traditional knowledge and also different tools and approaches. And it's, it's, it's a platform and a system that has been able to help them in terms of helping also in terms of feedback loop of information from different levels, whether from international level, local level, and forth and back within the community and helps in terms of monitoring what's happening in their system. Then they design action plans on how to respond. And, and also we have an example even in, in, in Kenya where they were able to use it to monitor resilience of sectors of the forest sector in, 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 in Narok County and also in Marsabit and in Narok it was Naimini and Kiyo forest. So Loita looking at the threats that and risk within the region in terms of conflict, even in a Majimoto area for water issue and using this system to collect data that can inform decision making and how they engage even in advocacy at the different level and local level to really show uh, the evidence on the risks that are happening and the importance of addressing uh, climate change and, and, and disaster risks within uh, the local policy planning, even in the 
community, I mean, integrated development planning. Next. Next slide, yeah. As well, there is also the aspect where community have been using uh, ecocultural mapping also to advance issues of ecosystem-based adaptation, but also to bring forth the knowledge of communities and also to facilitate the intergenerational transfer of knowledge through the different generations and also to really infuse the, the I mean, traditional and cultural values to reduce um, uh, forest degradation and also environmental risk posed by this, like in Taraka region by Institute of Culture and Ecology. There was, it's a dry area, but also had challenges in terms of uh, flooding and, and also they needed as well to address the issues of uh, impact on food security. And, and, and this, uh, Ecocultural mapping approach that fuses with ecosystem based adaptation approaches was able to support in terms of restoration of this knowledge and also the inform informing of local uh, planning in terms of the agricultural sector. They went ahead, even enabled the setting up of a farmer field school that also is continuing with, with advancing this kind of intergenerational learning and also showcasing how really fusion of different knowledge bases and multiple evidence bases can inform uh, addressing of, of risk and also how communities cope, can cope well and also using locally available resources. In terms of, um, we know uh, seeds, uh, different species are being impacted by climate change and also impact into the water catchment areas is, is critical and, and, and uh, affects really, uh, it's gendered in terms of the impact and, and, and one critical area in terms of uh, uh, climate change adaptation as well is the protection really of and restoration of this ecosystem and also protection of the seed systems, which are facing risk of being phased out and also impacting on the right to food sovereignty. And we have uh, initiatives where indigenous women's group have been able to engage in restoration of that and also informing local uh, agricultural agencies and also forestry research agencies and working in partnership really to advance and, and also ensure that uh, forest ecosystems are restored in line with the traditional uh, uh, way of understanding and also that is good for the ecosystem. Advocacy as well cannot be left out. I think uh, one critical area in, in, in doing work on climate change, I've realized most of the time we focus on adaptation and mitigation, but we really do not see them working and complementing together with the disaster risk reduction. And that is critical because they are complementary. And one partner within the Tastal Consortium, they're working on uh, really advocating for a local level climate change policy because at national level, for instance, in Kenya, we have the Climate Change Act, but at the local level, they're supposed to, domestic, to domesticate it at the default unit and they're able to really uh, push for and advocate for the integration of DRR as a component and, and that region as well has been experiencing a lot of flooding, landslide, which is climate related and so, uh, having advocacy as a component is, is really important. Next slide. And I'd like, like, uh, to 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 finish. I, I say uh, I think because they are best practices, but not exhaustive. But I think one of the aspect that really enable them to be best practice because they utilize already the existing community structures and networks and also the traditional systems that are already there and ensured uh, inclusion that different groups are involved in that even in the decision making and policy engagement communities were able to participate through their representatives it was also participatory and ensured that it worked across sectors, like for the climate information, the meteorologists worked with the agricultural people, the health people, and the county planners and the community themselves. 
and that was able to ensure continuity. And I've seen the same from Garissa. We have other counties like those in Embu, Nakuru, Transoya, like uh, already the metrologists are keeping the practice and continuing. And also it helps in terms of harnessing the few resources that we know our sectors do have and also the capacities that are there. It also tapped into the existing traditional knowledge. So that is a local capacity existing at the local level that most of the time is ignored yet can inform a lot of those decision making. Uh, it also fosters intergenerational learning. And uh, this is important really in terms of empowering the different groups at the community level. And also in terms of really ensuring that these actions are, and, and practices are also uh, sustainable and, and entrenched in the policy and the strategies at the local level. So it sort of ensures that uh, they are sustained and continue even beyond uh, partnership between non-state actors, CSOs and, and communities and government. They can still be sustained through the existing community structures. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. And sorry, Jonathan, I know you, that was quite a dive in the sea, but you survived. Um, so we'll go to our last speaker of the day, who is Mr. Emmanuel Tech. Uh, he is currently the program coordinator for, hmm, I'm definitely going to get this wrong, Environment, Development, Action, Energy. Yes? <laughs> and the energy. <laughs> That's and the energy. Um, Mr. Emmanuel brings to us his experience as an environmentalist who is currently a knowledge manager as well. He is the, he's a member of the GNDR Global Board as the regional representative for West and Central Africa. Maybe Mr. Sek, you can tell us who is uh, representing the East and South. And he also brings to us a lot of experience in leading programs on adaptation to climate change, climate finance, um, sustainable land management, and disaster risk management. So, Mr. Sek, please take it away. <laughs> so, thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Um, I'm happy to be the voice of all those um, uh, who work and um, uh, continue to work on um, by developing uh, community-based disaster risk reduction uh, action. So my presentation uh, comes from um, several um, experiences and initiative developed by CSOs, particularly uh, the member of GNDR, um, who are dealing uh, with climate disaster, uh, epidemics like cholera, uh, malaria, uh, floods, droughts, uh, coastal erosion, conflicts, and food security. Um, so we, uh, when we are tackling the issue related to, to disaster, uh, we, we often face uh, with hydrometeorological um, uh, problems or issues. Um, but we, we can note it if you look at the, uh, the background uh, that there is an increase of biological risk uh, in Africa. Uh, particularly um, with uh, some epidemic, we can see that uh, there is uh, five uh, of seven uh, deaths uh, allocated to, 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 to the attributed to ep epidemics. That means that it is really important. Uh, in its uh, regional economic uh, outlook uh, of October 2016, uh, the International Monetary Fund uh, showed the incidence of national disaster. Uh, particularly the epidemics in Africa. You can see uh, where we have the share in selected educators, uh, the part of the, uh, the epidemics, how it is important in our, in our, in our region. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, we face with the, the coronavirus. And within the coronavirus, we have seen that uh, in many countries, or uh, government have eased the uh, restriction uh, measure. Uh, so when it comes that you give people a uh, flexibility, uh, there is a need uh, to find alternative. And here the alternative is more or less uh, to promote community approach uh, to curb the impact of the, the, the COVID. And doing that, uh, need for me a uh, three main pillar, just to give a human, a human face of uh, the solution that uh, the community-based data series uh, reduction action uh, can give. The first uh, is related to uh, enhance or increase the knowledge. Based on the knowledge, uh, the information, the capacity. 
And the second will be the institution, how we can institutionalize uh, by uh, setting up some mechanism or tools, uh, the involvement, the participation, uh, and the fight uh, against the COVID uh, by learning from what people have done uh, previously when they were um, fighting against drugs, for example, uh, against epidemic and, and so on. Uh, so for the first pillar uh, related to the increase of, of awareness uh, and communities uh, engagement. Uh, for us, we have learned from some countries, for example, uh, DR Congo, Benin, Ghana, Niger, uh, and other countries uh, that uh, people have developed really uh, the uh, mass uh, communication. Uh, they have developed some mass awareness campaign for population, uh, development of sustainable risk prevention strategies uh, through process of processes of dialogue and social learning. And for the situation we are related to the COVID, uh, we think that uh, it is important to have a, a, a mass understanding, a large understanding of the, of the epidemic if we want to, to cope with, to change the behavior, and also mobilize and train the children and the youths. Uh, because uh, often we say that they are not uh, impacted really impacted by the COVID, uh, but they can transmit the COVID to, uh, to the elders. So I think we need um, to uh, aware them more, to train them, uh, to play a vital, a vital role uh, in disaster risk reduction, particularly uh, when it's come to cope with, cope with the, 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 the COVID, um, to assess the risk. So there is a possibility uh, when we use the approach of participatory disaster risk assessment, uh, that is developed, for example, in Ethiopia uh, by some uh, civil society organization. This can be applied if uh, we want, for example, to uh, increase or to enhance the diagnosis of the, of the problem uh, at the local level, but also when it's come to formulate appropriate plan and to identify the target beneficiaries. So for us, it is important uh, to have this kind of approach. Um, and then we, 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 there is the the, the volunteer, the intervention by uh, the volunteer, uh, who I, I have said it, uh, uh, can change uh, the mentality because uh, for the COVID, there is a need, a real need uh, to change the mentality and also the behavior uh, because um, there are some measures taken and people need really to adopt, to adopt this, um, uh, this measure to change their behavior uh, because there is a lot of uh, information, a lot of communication made by civil society organization, and also all the players or key players uh, in, in, in the process. So um, the government uh, call us to adapt and to live with the pandemic. So if that is the case, uh, there is really a need uh, to change the mentality, as I have said, and, and the behavior. And there are some uh, experiences uh, developed by civil society. Uh, particularly in many countries, for example, uh, in Madagascar, uh, in Ghana, uh, in Niger, where there is a, a, a key programs that the, the scouts uh, from Niger are developing uh, in support of uh, the, the government activities. So after the, the first pillar uh, of understanding, building capacities, uh, enhancing information, uh, for me, uh, it is important at least to build on the institutions or the facilities uh, that civil society have already developed uh, to enhance the, uh, the, the, the fight against the, the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, Sometimes we, we, we are trying to, uh, to find innovative, innovative uh, solution, but solution is there. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, the activities developed by civil society uh, in coping with floods in the country, uh, in Congo, Chad, uh, in Senegal, or, or elsewhere. Uh, so there is a, a, a real collaboration um, of CSOs with the local administration. And we think that this one is, is really a key. Um, uh, if we, we want to, uh, to adapt or to uh, fight against this, this pandemic. Um, so there is a collaboration also with the National Office uh, for the Risk and Disaster Management. Uh, for some countries, we have it uh, in Niger, Burkina Faso, for example, um, the uh, gathering or the collection of data. Someone has said the importance uh, that uh, 
the, the importance of the data. Uh, for example, if I take the case of, of Senegal, uh, it is difficult to really identify uh, the vulnerable uh, uh, families, I mean, uh, the household who really need uh, the support that the government is giving uh, to the uh, most vulnerable people against the, 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 the COVID. And if uh, previously we had uh, the main information that if you go, for example, in this region, you could easily identify uh, the uh, affected or the vulnerable communities. So that will uh, f help people uh, to uh, share uh, the, uh, the, to share the, 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 the resources uh, to support uh, the, 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 the communities. Um, we have in, in, in Niger, uh, the establishment and the operation of uh, neighb neighborhood level communities. Uh, when we are talking about a uh, community approach for us, uh, this is uh, really important because it's involve uh, the communities, uh, the, uh, the CSOs, uh, not only the beneficiaries, but do all those uh, who have possibilities uh, to support, uh, but this facilitates also the, the, the coherence in terms of initiative or uh, undertaking the initiative and also uh, to harmonize or align uh, with what the government is is doing, uh, this will avoid uh, to duplicate uh, and to lose the, the to to mutualize the, the to help uh, in mutualizing the, the resources. Uh, and the, uh, the 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 third um, uh, item related to the uh, uh, mechanism or the tools is the early warning com committee or the early warning uh, system. Uh, often the, the, the problem we have is uh, the, the, the prevention. If you look at, for example, um, the, the COVID, almost everyone uh, was surprised in many countries, particularly the, the developed countries. But in Africa, we can say that we have learned from them. Bef before uh, the, the, coming, uh, the, the COVID come uh, in our countries, uh, we had possibility to see how these developed countries dealt uh, with this, uh, this, this pandemic. Um, and if I, I may say uh, we have uh, the, the result uh, uh, we, we have now in Africa, uh, because we are the less, if I can say, uh, affected by the COVID, uh, it is part due to, uh, to that. I mean, uh, the, the, we anticipate in terms of, uh, of solution by learning uh, from the others and building on the uh, committees uh, such as the early warning system or the early warning system committee uh, for us is a, is a key. Um, and the, uh, in terms of accessing to, to the resources uh, in Burkina Faso, and I think also in Niger, uh, there is a financing system uh, named uh, Warrantage um, that's help uh, farmers uh, to cope with, uh, to, to have credit, to access to credit uh, for uh, to manage the, the agricultural uh, risk they may, they may have. So these are, for, for me, a solution uh, that came from, uh, from, the, from the ground, that came from the CSOs, uh, that can be, um, for me, scale up uh, in the uh, combat against the, 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 the COVID pandemic. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, um, I will um, conclude with what uh, BJ have said uh, in his... Uh, uh, speech or introduction. Uh, local actors are first respondent and frontliner uh, in dealing with disaster risk uh, and in detecting change uh, that occur in the environment and can be uh, a key success factor for minimizing uh, the, the, the risk. For us, it is important um, uh, in this context of the, of the COVID. Um, we should consider uh, community best practices, as I have said, because all those I have presented, which is not uh, exhaustive, uh, are findings from what people uh, are undertaking in the fields uh, when they have to deal with floods, uh, droughts, um, uh, uh, coastal erosion, um, or the disease um, in, 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 in the different countries. Um, so for us, these best practices uh, can really help and provide solution for an effective recovery and re reconstruction uh, with uh, contextualized responses plan 
uh, and resilience program. Uh, so it will be uh, good for us to mandate uh, local government units because there is a good collaboration uh, at the when we try to localize uh, the uh, the solution uh, amongst the different partners. I mean, civil society, uh, government, um, donors, um, scientists uh, to, to 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 perform uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, community-based risk assessment, but also uh, in elaborating uh, the, the, the policies or to inform the policies. Uh, in some countries, um, there are some uh, uh, plans that was developed, for example, uh, civil society support uh, for the elaboration of uh, a municipal action plan uh, for risk reduction and better uh, disaster preparedness. So um, we, we faced with the uh, the COVID now, uh, we could not say that there is not a basis of action or solution. Solution are there, is up to us to know or to see how we could uh, use it to better cope with this, uh, this pandemic. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Emmanuel, and that, uh, for that very informative um, presentation and on sharing experience with us. Um, to kick off our q and I'll start with a few remarks. First of all, um, the, all the presentations will be shared with the participants as well as rec the, a recording of the webinar at a later date, so do not worry about that. I'm seeing a lot of comments on that. Um, at this point, I'll just First, before I assign questions to the panelists, I'd just like to give them two minutes each to give a, a few remarks on what they think can, they want to share at this point. Amjad, do you want to go first? Hello, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to begin first of all by, by just saying how, how enriching these uh, presentations were and uh, particularly for, for me here working at the uh, UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, since we're a regional office, we often uh, miss out on these uh, really specific uh, community experiences that were provide, provided by the colleagues. And I'm very much um, impressed by, by what I have heard. There's been a lot of good questions also in the, in the question chat box. So I encourage people to look at those. I tried to answer some. Um, I, I, I picked up a few things, if I may say, I think uh, particularly on the COVID and uh, from Mr. BJ's presentation, I, I really liked the, the message that he talked about, the, the, the fact that the, the, the pandemic is global, it's still the risk is local. And I thought that was uh, very catchy and very important to, to look at. And it also underlined uh, the importance of, uh, and I think it's said by many other speakers, is is, how, is is the local responders, the local local responders, and one of the things that I thought was quite important is the issue of communicating the the, the, the risk of COVID nineteen, particularly at the co uh, local level. I think uh, <clears throat> we're able to communicate that risk in a in in a rather you know many of the countries in Europe are able to communicate this this risk. The the more developed countries through uh, you know chats and. Uh, social media sources but um, that only goes so far in, at, at the local level particularly in Africa so I think uh, um, th that that particular focus that was mentioned by the speakers was was very important um, I was also very much uh, impressed by Mr. Gaston and, and the need to identify the local context to before we design projects often we hurry up and design projects and just pretend that we know what the local context is, or what the local needs are, and and that's that's a big mistake, and it takes a bit more time, and we need to find a way to do that in a quicker way, to ensure that we get resources to where it's needed as, as soon as possible. And uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Gaston also gave us the option of whether for COVID-19 we should resist or adapt or 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 transform. I wonder if we can do a combination of these uh, of these issues. Um, the community-based early warning I found very interesting, and um, and, and it's something that we struggle with, uh, not only for in uh, in COVID, but also for not normal disasters. One of the issues we have is you're able to get the early warning uh, uh, information at the national level or even at the regional level, but it's very hard or often challenging 
to have to uh, to make sure that it has the impact that it, that is needed. In other words, to be communicated to those who need it, where the cyclone is going to hit, where the flash flood is coming. And I think uh, <coughs> it was mentioned uh, by Mr. Sek also the importance. Um, um, you know that, that that can be done and we just have to find a way uh, to ensure that that, that is done also uh, edna was uh, very much i uh, was very much impressed by her uh, presentation and, um, and explaining the examples and of traditional knowledge and the importance of and using that even for early warning so i mean this is just a general impression that i have uh, and, and some of the things that i picked up uh, during the discussion Okay, thank you, thank you for those remarks, uh, Amjad. Um, I'll give this chance to Mr. BJ. We'll give you a few more minutes because we lost you during your presentation. I'm so sorry. if you had something left out, please use this chance to share it with us. Well, like I say, this sometimes happens in London, yeah, that we are suddenly disconnected from the world. Uh, but I just actually wanted to give thanks and I was just telling that time uh, that uh, most part of my life was spent in Africa. I actually uh, spent 15 years in living in 14 countries. And last was in uh, Kenya for four years before I moved back to London. Uh, so my heart is still in Africa. So when I listened and actually looked at the profile of the people who were attending this, uh, I, I, I felt really homesick. That's the, that's, the, that's the thing that I just wanted to say. And second, Isa, you asked who, who are the board members from Africa in GNDR. We have three more. Uh, Louis M. from Zimbabwe, who represents Southern Africa. Uh, we have Prime, who is attending, by the way. He is attending this, uh, I, I saw his name. He is from East Africa. Uh, and North Africa and West Asia is Emad, Dr. Emad uh, from Egypt. So this forms our representation from Africa. Now, uh, thanks a lot, Amjad, for brilliantly summarizing. For us, I will not dare to uh, add to what uh, Mr. Amjad said. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate a uh, few things. One, if we come together, if we work together, uh, uh, we can definitely prevent any hazard becoming a disaster. We can. We can. We can collectively build the resilience of those people who are most at risk, we can do this. What is actually required is a commitment to come together. Now, we are divided because we are UN, we are INGOs, we are local NGOs, we are political parties, we are national government, we are divided. We are divided because we are actually working on climate change, somebody is working on women's rights, somebody is working on a sustainable development goal, and somebody is working on Sendai framework. So like I say, we are divided in various, various ways. And we are also divided because we are man and woman, and uh, there's a cultural division, there's a patriarchy which is actually dividing us. We are divided because there is unequal relationship in the society because of our class, because of our economic conditions. There are lots of divisions. Can we actually, for a change in the new world, that COVID-19 has told us that we are one united global village. Anything, one thing happens in one country is going to impact everybody. That is what the global nine, uh, the COVID-19 told us. But experience will be local. And can we come together to see how we analyze the multi-hazards, how we bring the analysis from the perspective of that very woman who has been raped, who has experienced multiple denial of rights and is most dispossessed and that person who's living with disability, that person who is HIV positive, uh, how can we actually bring our perspective from their perspective, analyze the impact of the risk, come together as one society, work with building the capacity with uh, the local organizations and the local authorities so that we can challenge and confront each and every hazard that we are experiencing today. And we can prevent that becoming a disaster. And we can do this by building our resilience. <coughs> That's all I will actually appeal to all of us. Doesn't matter wherever we are, whatever we are doing. <coughs> can you think of the can we think of risk? Come together and work together to build resilience. And it's possible. I just wanted to reiterate this. Thanks, Isa. <coughs> Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Vijay. Um, I'll also extend a few minutes for to Mr. Bu to just share what's on top of your mind. Two minutes before we get into the Q. &A. Okay, thank you very much, Isabel. Um, maybe I don't know if what I should share. I can just quickly also input to what I've seen on the question and answers. I saw some a few questions there directed directly to myself. So uh, someone did mention about the issue of insecurity that is going on, particularly in Cameroon, in the northwest, southwest, as well as in the northern part of the country, and, and how we can respond to COVID-19 in such a situation. I think in the opening of the presentation, I did also mention about the importance of understanding the local context in designing any um, response and recovery to this pandemic. We can be able to do any particular um, response and recovery without us understanding this, this uh, context. So that is just a simple example of the particular context that we find ourselves in some of these uh, situations in Cameroon. We know the pandemic is everywhere in the world. The WHO has uh, issued specific guidelines to respond to and curb the spread of this pandemic. But at the same time, with the, the, the measures that have been put in place in the United States, in China, in Europe, cannot be the same method that we might want to put in place in Africa or in a specific country. Or even within that country, uh, we have to look at specific communities, what are there, to be able to take this into consideration in order to respond to this current pandemic that is hitting us. I think that is what I would like to answer to the participant who asked that question. I'm aware of the issue. It's quite a big challenge. It adds to the burden we are going through as a civil society organization or as actors in disaster risk reduction domain. When there are insecurity, it makes this very, very complicated and quite challenging to do any activities. So the second thing I will mention is about someone also mentioned, asked a question about how we can use physical science, social science in responding to or in designing uh, community resilient activities. So my response to this participant would be that it is very important to come together to, as the director of GNDR has mentioned about the importance of force, not trying to self looking ourselves that I'm working on DRR, I'm working on climate change, I'm a politician, no, we should look at how we can come together. So your work scientists, physical scientists, even using local or indigenous knowledge, we need to bring all of this to, to be able to better understand what is happening in our different community and to respond to this effectively. Because if we say, no, I'm a social scientist, I can only do this as a physical scientist, or local communities will think only about how they can use local knowledge. But we need to look for a way of coming together as the GNDI executive director has clearly mentioned, how we can bring these different knowledge together in better understanding what is happening and how we can design ways of responding to I think this is what I can input for now, unless maybe there is something else. Thank you, Isabel. Yeah, we'll have a, a round of Q&A as well. Um, Edna, over to you for two minutes. Yeah, uh, I'd like to say, I think I had uh, I've seen some questions. Uh, before I come to the question, I think one thing I'd like to highlight uh, about the COVID what has it has taught us if we ever needed any proof uh, that humanity and people can globally organize to collectively to respond to challenges covid has shown us that and i would say like for indigenous people we we saw people non-state actors, people organizing really to set up a resilience fund. Why not do it even in other situations beyond COVID? Like we can still organize and, 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 and this has shown us we can do better if we already have systems in place to respond to any risk. So those who did not have any, uh, I mean, uh, community systems in place, 
are worried they do not have access to information. So I think um, COVID can give us a lesson on how really we can move forward and show that we need to work collectively, even on issues of DRR, in issues of climate change. Uh, as well, uh, someone asked about uh, issues of sustainability, about the community-based, say, uh, monitoring information system in terms of uh, the financing and, and beyond the project. But I would say it's an initiative convened by communities themselves, even though it has external funding, but also it's using a lot of community-based resources and also uh, in terms of uh, people, in terms of facilities, networks, and also the institutions that are there. And also it's managed by community itself. So when they're doing their continuous livelihood, they're collecting information. And, and also the sustainability aspect comes in, in the fact that the information collected informs the community action planning and also how they advocate for better development planning at the local level. So already if it's in the development plan, like in the land use plan at the local level, or even in the climate change uh, plan at the, at the local level, the government then is mandated to implement it because also the community is doing advocacy and also monitoring the government commitments with it so that ensures as well sustainability and ownership of the initiative i think i would that's my few cents here thank you thanks edna over to you mr emmanuel uh, thank you uh, very much uh, isabel uh, i will focus on um, two main things uh, the first one is how the COVID is uh, integrated in the, uh, in the gender process or strategies. Um, we have reviewed the, uh, the, the global strategies, gender uh, strategies, um, and uh, give important parts uh, to deal with uh, the, the epidemics. Uh, often when we are, we are talking about um, uh, the, the disaster, uh, it's more or less um, uh, disaster related to um, environment i mean natural disaster climate change disaster but few on epidemic uh, except for um issue related to ebola or, or cholera something like that but for the for for the covid uh, we have learned that we should focus more uh, on on epidemic and then uh, it would be good for us i think um, gender member or or other other players uh, to bring the issue to a citizen dimension. When I say bring the issue to a citizen dimension, that means that we are all responsible. Uh, how we are all responsible is that there are flexibility uh, uh, given by the, by the government. And this call that we said it change mentality and behavior to at least protect uh, the others. I mean, when we protect ourselves, we protect the others. So when we, 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 we are affected, others who are, closely, who are close to us uh, are affected. So let's bring the issues uh, to, the, um, to a citizen uh, dimension and see um, alongside the implementation of the uh, new strategies, uh, just to inform that uh, gender have, uh, has, uh, has a, a new strategy. Uh, that we were supposed uh, to, to validate or to adopt uh, during the, uh, the plan uh, global, global summit, but we did not have chance because of the COVID to organize uh, or to, to organize this, this, um, uh, this global summit. So it is part, the, the, the COVID is part of the, of the global strategy of, uh, of GNDR. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm hearing a lot of uh, emphasis on the need for coherence, the need to use an inclusive approach to make sure all of society is engaged in the process and no one is left behind, and also the need to share lessons and experiences and challenges so that we can all learn from the past and not repeat uh, the same mistakes. And there's also a lot of uh, call for strengthening of governance systems and reviewing how we work at the different levels of government and with different stakeholders. And of course, the need to establish systems to ensure that our interventions are actually sustainably um, managed throughout and you know, to, not, to re remove that uh, reliance on external uh, support. 
so to kick off our Q&A session, we have quite a bit of questions, but we will try our best. I'll pose the first question to Mr. Abashar, and there's a question on information management. Um, can you please uh, uh, um, respond to the need or how can we ensure that communities are engaged, especially when it comes to the ownership of information or data when it comes in the, I mean, in the, in the whole agenda of resilience, how can we strengthen the local governments to be able to be more, you know, transparent and to allow the CSOs to come in and play their part in a sustainable way? No, thank you. Thank you, Isabel, for the question and for the person who asked it. Um, I think one of, one, one of the critical areas, and I mentioned this earlier, is, is to have data uh, to strengthen risk information about losses and, uh, and use that to uh, address, uh, you know, plan development, uh, if I may be simplistic. However, the sense that I am getting uh, sitting at the regional level is that the, the, the data is probably available in great, to a great extent at the local level. However, when we go to the central level, the national government level, we don't really see that data uh, in most cases, not all cases, in most cases, that data being reflected at the national level. In other words, uh, in, in, in their statistics, in their uh, disaster loss databases that, that we work with them to develop. And one, one particular area that's difficult that we don't find in, and I think somebody mentioned it, is data on epidemics and health losses. And, um, and, and I think this is a big challenge. And, and I do believe that the, the volunteers and the community-based organizations, uh, even local governments, there might be some, you know, it tells me that there might be a disconnect um, in, in, in transferring or a system in place in trust to, that would facilitate the transfer of that uh, information and data that is needed greatly to the central level uh, to make sure that uh, it, you know, uh, whatever considerations and challenges of economic losses due to disasters or due to health epidemics are taken account in the planning, even in, 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 in long-term budgets that the national governments might be doing. I'm not saying that this is happening in all countries in Africa, but this is something that we're beginning to notice, and often there's a dearth of, 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 of data. And I think it's very important, and it's, uh, I think uh, the local communities, uh, NGOs at the local level, uh, you know, the Red Cross, Red Crescent uh, uh, system can uh, play an important role in having a system by which that data is collected in the first place and then also uh, transferred to the political level to the decision makers. Thank you. Um, thank you, Amjad. And now over to BJ. Maybe you can also complement on um, the issue of information. Uh, but also specifically, you spoke about breaking barriers when it comes to uh, implementing commitments towards resilience. How can we um, manage the impacts and how can we learn from the impacts and the consequences of what you are going through right now as through the COVID disaster into future planning? The way I see it, like say, uh, uh, the information, uh, uh, Mr. Amjad has articulated very well. Uh, let me not uh, add, I'll just actually re echo what he said. Uh, but the second part of your question that you talked of, the resilience, the number one, we must be uh, retaining our focus as to resilience of whom. So we are talking of resilience of those people who are experiencing the multiple denial of rights or, and the risk, multiple risk. So we are talking of resilience of those people or those communities. And they might be the women, they might be person living with disability, person living with HIV AIDS, might be a minority ethnic group who have been uh, going through violence or experiencing uh, the, the various discrimination. So th this is what the group that you are talking of. How can we actually create that perspective? That is what the way Mr. Gaston was explaining. Perhaps there is a need to see how that discussion happens at that level, community level get that perspective and analyze the risk from their perspective and then make a plan. And those plans need to be reflected into the local government plan. Like say, for example, in Kenya, Kenya, uh, the system is that actually the counties uh, is expected, is a, is a 
a right uh, of the community to inform the government plans. Yeah. So, like I said, the government each and every government plan is to be informed by the uh, public participation. Yeah. So, can we actually ensure that the community is participating, informing those perspectives, and making the local government and the national government accountable to uh, their their uh, their commitments? So now let's not only stay only at that level. So the same thing, let us think of how we bring that up to ECOWAS level, to uh, Africa Union level, to global interactions. How can we actually ensure that uh, the global commitment is actually retained? How can we ensure that US is not suddenly backing out that we will not be part of, we will not be funding WHO anymore? So let's say how those commitments are actually respected and how 0.7% when the G G, the GNI, global national income of most of the countries, the, the government national income of the most of the countries are coming down. So 0.7% might not be relevant. Should we actually stick to the absolute figure of the money that need to be made available rather than going to 0.7% which will be now reduced because the gross national income is al already reduced by 15 to 20%. So how can we make them, make ourselves as a global community accountable? So in my understanding, the, the resilience can best be pursued with a localization, but that localization, which is informed by the global actions, with none of the country, none of the unit is remaining as independent, isolated republics. So all, all of us, we are linked and we are a global village. So we need to actually understand the global processes, but take the decisions at the local level, led primarily by the local authorities, local uh, governments and the local communities and adopt an all society approach which adequately gives space to the civil society organization to facilitate and to ensure that this process happens. Because it will be rarely be possible by the government to do this. To bring all society, perhaps it will be difficult for government to do it. To facilitate bringing the perspective of the communities most at risk will be difficult for the government. Perhaps there is a role for the civil society organization to do it bring those perspectives to inform and make all of us accountable, including civil society, including all actors. So that is the way I think that we can take it forward and accept COVID-19 as one more critical hazard. So when we are discussing and analyzing, we should keep in mind that that is one more hazard which might have an impact on anything and everything that we are planning today. So anything and everything that we do, must be risk informed and those risks must, must include multiple risks that all of us who live in those contexts experience on a day in and day out basis. So it is not an event in the life of people that they experience disaster. It is part and parcel of the living. So can we analyze that living from their perspective and analyze those risks including COVID and then try to design how we can actually respond and change the conditions of those people uh, who are currently uh, most at risk. Thank you, BJ. I will open this up, the next question up to the panelists, whoever feels they want to address it. And the question is on how do we link the indigenous knowledge and early warning systems to prepare for disasters, especially uh, from a multi-hazard uh, perspective? Anyone in the panel? Anyone wants to take that? I, Isabel, can I? Yes, please. Yeah, it, it, it's a loaded question. I think other people can, can also address, but I think uh, we've seen different examples where it's, it's a local context where uh, uh, fusion of indigenous knowledge where actors can come on board together, both scientists and also um, traditional knowledge holders and, and using um, where they use it as a multiple evidence base where you compile all information, validate it and you're able to use it to inform decision making based on the findings from all actors coming together and, and, and bridging all the information and findings. So that's what I would say at this point here. Yeah. Um, hello. 
Yes, please Hello. go ahead, Emmanuel. Yeah, so um, I would like to uh, bring uh, responses on two issues. Um, the first one is related to uh, the reliable information. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the COVID context, so many people who are uh, contaminated uh, in our countries uh, are marginalized. Uh, that's mean that in our mind, uh, the COVID is, um, we, 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 we did not really understand the, 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 the COVID. If we, it's come that we marginalize uh, people who are affected. Uh, this means that where, when some people or some family uh, have someone who is affected, uh, so they, they are uh, a little bit uh, excluded in the, in, the, in the community. And for, for me, it is important uh, to gather the information. I mean, every day uh, we have the situation in many countries, um, often uh, underestimated uh, number of those who are affected. We can say that uh, every day we have 100 or something like that. But for me, it is under, underestimated because sometimes we don't have all the information. And if we uh, involve the neighborhood delegates, I mean, those who are close to the community, uh, they may give the information. Uh, and then after we, we gather the information or we collect the information at the, at the national level, but we lose a lot of information related to how many people uh, are affected or contaminated by the, uh, by, by, by the COVID. Um, and, and then it's depend on uh, when we are talking about the solution, uh, for example, some people gave uh, medicine, uh, and I think that the traditional medicine uh, could be explored uh, to know exactly, because uh, you, you can see that, for example, in Madagascar, they have found some plants, uh, medicinal plants that may help. Uh, why will not explore uh, the solution given by uh, the, the, the traditional medicine uh, to, to cope with this issue of, of COVID, because solution are there is, is up to the academic uh, to see how they collaborate better uh, with uh, uh, those who, who, who have the, the, the traditional or the local know-how uh, to, to find a bet, uh, better solution for, for, for Africa. No, thank you, Manuel. Do we have anyone else who wants to comment on that? Hello, Isabella, you want me to say something? Yes, please, Mr. Bo. Okay, so I just want to add that I think, particularly with regards to COVID-19, I think it was actually a challenge at the onset of this pandemic, when, uh, especially in Africa, a lot of traditional doctors were proposing solutions to, to respond to this or to help uh, cases. We got a lot of criticism uh, that, uh, WHO has to approve some of these medications before they can actually be used. But we realize that a lot of people do argue that we are actually in a pandemic in an emergency situation in which uh, we need not just look at the scientific aspect of doing things, but we also have to welcome the traditional knowledge and try to see how we put this knowledge together to be able to respond to this situation rather than trying to always want to follow the formal or conventional approach that we've been using in uh, responding to situation. I think it's quite important at this time in point to think of how to bring together this knowledge. Because before the pandemic, we've also observed this, particularly with responding to other type of disasters, particularly here in Cameroon. I take the simple example of Mount Cameroon, which is a volcano mountain. This mountain erupts and we have a seismogram, which are scientific methods of detecting when this mountain is going to erupt. But the indigenous people, the local Bakwarians who live around these mountains, have over the years put in place local knowledge that is capable of telling you when the mountain is to erupt. So you may, they use animals or they use uh, just water springs around the mountain to be able to predict. So we've used this to talk to people and to make uh, have this kind of discussion on the importance of bringing together scientific knowledge, indigenous and local knowledge together in better understanding specific hazards and responding to these hazards. Thank you. 
thank you, Mr. Bu. At the risk of um, missing some important points, as interesting as this webinar has been, I'm afraid we have to close at this point. We're almost running to two hours. Um, so I would like to first express my sincere gratitude to our regional director, UNDRR, um, Amjad Abashar, and your colleague, um, the executive director, GNDR, Mr. BJ Kumar. Our panelists as well, Mr. Bu Gaston, Ms. Edna Kaptoyo, Mr. Emmanuel Sek, thank you so much um, for participating in this webinar and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I'm not sure if um, we would have uh, closing remarks from either UNDRR or GNDR or both, uh, but um, from me, your um, facilitator of the day, Isabel Njihia, it's been a pleasure and we'll definitely get back to you on all the questions. I'm seeing still questions coming in on the tools available and uh, how to monitor and integrate uh, DRR in local plans. And we'll definitely be getting back to you on that and uh, sharing the recording as well. To our interpreter as well, Jonathan, thank you so much for your support and we look forward to working with you in future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank very you much. Very much. Thank, you so much. thank you, Isabella, for the great Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.